Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. I thought uh, we'd spend some time today practicing uh, synthesis. I think uh, there were some questions last time suggesting it was somewhat unclear in some folks' mind what was actually going to be on this exam. Uh, we talked about everything in Chapter 11 and everything new in Chapter 11 that we're going to do last time. Uh, today will be practice of synthesis and mechanisms. Um, and let's see. Other than that, I think we'll get going. I have some some great dad jokes going on in the chat. I am all, all kind, all kinds of stressed. I think we heard that one before. That one's funny. And then the response is from JJ, we're not all al keen to learn today. I'm liking that. I'm going to write that down and put it in my repertoire. Um, by the way, this, uh, this is just a decoy. There aren't actually any answers to exam three there. I'm not sure if any of you saw the line there. I'm just messing with you, which is not funny, I realize. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Everyone's like hitting like triple zoom on the zoom, zoom, zoom. <laughs> All right. Um, I wrote the exam yesterday and it's all ready to go. There's like 20 questions on it, so it's a little shorter than usual because I ran out of ideas and time. So. Hopefully that'll help you get through it a little bit more quickly. Don't stress in the aftermath, I will be able to give partial credit uh, afterwards. So um, I know some of you, when you hear there are fewer questions on the exam, think, oh no, fewer opportunities to earn points or larger impact for mistakes. But don't worry because there will be uh, chances for me to give partial credit for uh, in some cases. So not to stress about that. And I will have something else to say about stress a little bit later uh, if I decide to do that or not. I don't know. It went okay. No, I'll explain later. I had kind of a disaster during the noon class, but we'll move on. So here is a synthesis problem straight out of chapter 10. And if you want practice on this kind of thing, the end of chapter questions from here on out are going to have synthesis questions to, uh, to practice, and they're all very good. Uh, so there's all kinds of different synthesis questions. One of them is to give you a specific starting material and a specific product and then say, how do I get from A to B? Uh, in other cases, they, have you get, they give you a list of allowed starting materials and they say, make this final product however you want using these starting materials. Uh, one of my observations uh, is as students are trying to learn synthesis, uh, they feel like they should be able to just sort of read and study enough and then they can do it. But actually this is like riding a bike or learning to walk. You don't do it by learning about it. You do it, you learn it, you learn it by doing it. Um, and so you just sort of have to practice and fumble your way through it till, uh, until uh, you begin to learn some principles. One thing I have observed though is that students tend to panic some anyway when they see uh, molecules that have rings in them. I think there's just something, um, maybe it's some residual PTSD from high school geometry, like, oh no, a pentagon. I forgot the formula that tells me what the internal angle of a regular pentagon needs to be. I don't know. Um, so. It can be useful, a useful skill to develop as you grow as a scientist to know what to pay attention to and what to ignore, all right? Uh, as you look at this question, make uh, this molecule turn into that one. Look at what's changing and look at what isn't. Looks like I'm losing a chloride. Looks like I'm making an epoxide. But the five-membered ring is there and doesn't change. So it may make it easier and simpler for you to simply abbreviate all of that as an R group. And suddenly it looks a lot less intimidating. Now that may or may not help you, and, and it's sometimes tough for me to remember 
what it's like to look at a molecule like this and be afraid of it because I've learned what I can ignore. Uh, and so if that looks more tolerable to you, by all means, rewrite the, que uh, the question that way. So now we can focus only on the things that need to change. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to do this in the forward direction because there are many different things we've learned to do with alkyl halides. We've learned to do substitution and elimination reactions with them. Uh, but we're not totally sure where we need to go. And so sometimes it can be great to uh, begin with the end in mind, right? This is the classic uh, classic statement from Lewis Carroll's uh, Alice in Wonderland, or maybe it's Through the Looking Glass, I don't know, where, where I only know this because I'm remembering President Monson said something about it at one point. So it's the second, third hand, but Alice asks the Cheshire cat, where should I go? And he asks, well, where do you want to end up? And she says, I don't know. And she, he says, then it doesn't much matter, does it? And similarly, you want to begin with the end in mind. All right, that wasn't the, the, the philosophical part. There's more coming. Um, what reaction do we know that generates an epoxide as a product? We only know one at this point. Um, of course, at home when you're taking the exam, you'll have the opportunity to look stuff up. It may be worthwhile to you to actually write down on a single or two sheets of paper the reactions that we've learned so that you can have them in one place and aren't fumbling around trying to look stuff up. Go ahead. Oh, I'm gonna... Go ahead. Yeah, answer the question. Uh, okay. Uh, we've learned to make epoxides from, uh, you said nucleophile. Did you perchance mean adjacent. leaving group? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so a leaving group adjacent to an OH group, we've, and then what do we do to that to make the epoxide? Um, you gotta remove the protons so that um, the oxygen can kick off the leaving group. Right, you remove the proton on the oxygen so you can do the intramolecular SN2 reaction and that gives you the epoxide. So for that purpose, we want a base and I would allow you to use basically any strong base that you want to. So what your text typically does is the most efficient one, which is to use sodium hydride. This is a strong base, but it's also not a particularly uh, good nucleophile because of solubility issues. Uh, but I would have allowed any, uh, any base, that, and that will make the epoxide. Uh, sometimes it can be helpful. I, I, you don't have to memorize compound names, but if you... Uh, are thinking about reactions in terms of what they do, uh, and you've thought about or remember the halo hydrin formation reaction, it may be good to recognize the structural pattern of having an OH adjacent to a halide. And then now we've got a simpler synthesis problem. Uh, we're one step uh, in. Now we have to ask, well, what is the halo hydrin the product of? What is the starting material and what is the reagent that gives you that halo hydrin? So, anybody know? Yeah. Okay, so you'd need uh, an alkene plus a halide, an OH. We could use the chlorohydrin or the bromohydrin. Either would be okay. And then your starting material would have been, for that step, would have been this alkene. I'll point out that um, you could have used bromine uh, and water easily as well, uh, and I would have allowed other strong bases. Uh, this is one place where synthesis makes people uncomfortable because many times in life we want there to be one a right answer and we want somebody to pat us on the head and tell us that we got the right answer and ours was the only right answer so we can feel good. Uh, synthesis is a bit more open-ended. Often there are multiple ways to get from A to B. And in fact, it's a whole, I told the noon class, it's a whole area of organic chemistry devoted to outdoing other people's syntheses by doing it in fewer steps. So they'll, uh, people will, sometimes biologists or natural product isolation chemists will grind up, you know, tons of a marine sponge and extract organic soluble things from the marine sponge lysate and they'll isolate these really complicated natural products and then the organic chemists will say wow that's a pretty looking molecule let's see if we can make it 
And so somebody will publish the first total synthesis of this natural product X or whatever. And it took, you know, um, 150 steps and the yield was like 0.0001% and they ended up with two milligrams, which they then used to test it on some cancer cell lines and lo and behold, it killed a cancer cell. So now they want to study it, but they can only make one or two milligrams. So somebody else comes along and says, hey, we weren't the first, but we're better than you. We're going to make it in smaller number of steps and higher yield and then somebody else publishes a paper later saying haha you're both idiots i made it the best way of all and then 10 years later somebody else comes along so anyway trying to find multiple solutions to this is a is is all part of the game and so when you're practicing synthesis problems you may come up with a pathway that is different than the one that's in the solutions manual and so you may have to take a little bit of time to go back and look and confirm that your pathway works. The standard of judging synthesis questions is, does the chemistry work? And you may need to consult a TA or me to ask whether you know, your method would work, uh, but understand that there are gonna be sometimes multiple ways of getting from A to B, and I'll try to illustrate that in a second. Um, okay, alkene, do we know of a reaction? And as we get further on, stepping backward, we can start to, ask, do we have anything that directly connects starting material to product? So I'll ask that. Do we know of a way to turn the primary alkyl halide into the olefin? What's that? That's just elimination, E2 chemistry. For a primary alkyl halide, probably we want to use a strong base that is sterically hindered so we don't have to worry about uh, the competing SN2 reaction. One of the ones we could use would be tert butoxide, but there's some others that work as well. DBU or DBN uh, would work there equally well. And so once we've, once we've connected everything back to the beginning, then you can review it as though it's a predict the products question and say, okay, if I use this starting material with this reagent, would it give me this product? check. Okay, if I use this starting material and these reagents, would I get this product with the OH on the more substituted carbon? Yes. Uh, and then if I used a base, would it do the intramolecular SN2 reaction to give me the epoxide? Sure. Okay, questions about how we walk through that? Doesn't turn out to be that many steps. Looks like about three steps. And in chapter 12, we're going to learn a new reaction that will take us directly. Nope not directly, uh, will take us from the alkene directly to the epoxide uh, instead of through the halohydrin. That doesn't make one pathway preferred over the other, it just means you've got a couple of op options. The uh, first hour class wanted me to assure them, uh, I hereby swear that's not how you spell swear. <laughs> That's like past tense. He swear an oath. I hereby swear or affirm not to ask questions about chapter 12 on exam 3 which is not detailed enough, in the winter 2021 semester of Chem 351, sections one through infinity, uh, forever and ever, amen, <laughs> with blood <laughs> dripping. Okay, so don't worry about the fact that there is a reaction that can take you from the alkene to the epoxide yet, not on exam three. Uh, but as soon as we get to chapter 12, we'll learn about it. Okay, other questions? Good. All right. Um, let's do another one. Uh, somebody asked in the first hour, and I thought it was useful, uh, if there are multiple pathways, are you ever going to have to choose between one that's good and one that's better? Um, only if there's a clear way that you could tell that one was better. Uh, so I, I'm not generally going to ask a question where I say, in as few steps as is possible, 
get from A to B. Instead, uh, if I want you to evaluate synthetic methods, I might give you a couple options and ask you which one is better. So uh, we talked about making this ether in the first hour. And we talked about how there might be a couple different methods you could use. Uh, actually, I don't want it to be a methyl group. I want it to be an ethyl group. Uh, two different options. You could do an SN2 reaction using this alkoxide as the nucleophile and using this alkyl halide as the electrophile, or you could use, and this arrow is a retrosynthetic arrow, that's the kind of arrow we use when we're thinking backwards. You could think about using this alkyl halide and this alkoxide instead. Now, uh, one of these is better than the other. And evaluating it often involves thinking about the reaction in the forward direction. So I might say here, here I have a good nucleophile that is also a good base, and I have a secondary alkyl halide. And then I would remember from chapter seven and eight that in that situation, you expect SN2 and E2 to compete. So that would mean in addition to the desired product, I would expect to see the uh, competing elimination product. I just drew the conjugate acid of our base, which we can ignore. Uh, now, if I evaluate the other thing, I've got a good nucleophile that's also a good base. Some people may look at that and say, that's starting to look like terp-butoxide, but there's only two methyl groups instead of three, and so that's still an okay nucleophile for SN2 reactions. I have a primary alkyl halide, and in chapters seven and eight, we learned that SN2 reactions are so fast for primary alkyl halides that we can ignore the E2 reaction. So this is the preferred method because we don't have to deal with an undesired byproduct. So that's a case where, you know, given two reactions that seem reasonable, there would be a way to tell whether one is preferred versus the other. But I think, I think the uh, competition between SN2 and E2 is maybe the only context that you're currently prepared uh, to make that kind of evaluation. Um, all right, let's do another one, unless there's questions. Let me... Oh man, there's just um, so many, so many jokes from the chat. This is fantastic. Like, you know what I mean? It'd be better if you knew about the functional group that's called an imine, because you could write it like that and then say, you know what I mean, but whatever. Um, stop. I, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of more jokes. Um, it's a standard organic chemistry joke to talk about um, naming your daughter ethyl ester, or perhaps methyl ester, though ethyl ester so-and-so would be more normal than methyl ester. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, let's do a ketone. And uh, we'll say that you need to make this from this alkyne and other things. <laughs> Which again is irritating because it's open-ended. What do I mean by other things? Anything else containing carbon, any other reagent that actually works you, the only rules here are you have to include acetylene. It ha two of the carbons in this molecule have to come from that alkyne. All right? So uh, in particular, when you're dealing with very simple starting materials, it's better to start at the end and ask, what was the reaction that led to this ketone? Now, this is a, there's only one of these we've learned so far. This is a chapter 11 reaction. Anybody... Remember what it is? Yeah, go ahead. Is it, uh, 
hydroboration oxidation of an alkyne. So let's see, one, two, and then there's two carbons on either end. So you're saying if we did this, that would give us first, what would that do? That would give us the, uh, yikes, alkene. Oh, sorry. I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, the product of that reaction would be the, this enol, right? Because that's hydroboration works on alkynes just like it works on olefins. You add H to one of the carbons and OH to the other. And then we said the enol spontaneously tautomerizes to the more stable ketone isomer. Okay, and actually this is one of those cases where there's gonna be another option because you could also do alkyne hydration. Uh, that is, you know, using catalytic H2SO4 and acid, you could get the same thing. The reason that works, you know, typically we've said alkyne and alkene hydration puts the OH on the more substituted carbon, whereas hydroboration oxidation puts it on the less substituted carbon. Both of those carbons of the alkyne are bonded to other carbons. There is no difference in substitution, so uh, it doesn't matter which method, which of those two methods we use. All right. <clears throat> Now we ask, do we see a clearer pathway to include the carbons of this alkyne in our final product? What ideas do you have? Yeah, go ahead. I, well, you can deprotonate the uh, initial alkyne uh, and that can be used without the going to another two carbon group. Okay. So once you start to see things, this is great. Once you start to see things, you maybe can go back to the beginning and start to move forward, start to go in a forward direction as well and just try to con connect the two threads. There's not one right way to do this. So uh, yeah, what, what you pointed out was we can deprotonate the alkyne to turn it into a good nucleophile and then we can do the SN2 reaction that would connect that alkyne to two other carbons. And then can we, then what do we do to get from our four carbon thing to the six carbon thing? Yeah, go ahead. Is it possible at this point to just deprotonate that H again? Yep, just do it again. Deprotonate the, <laughs> deprotonate the H out of that molecule. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a fun one. Um, uh, and then, yeah, add the other alkyl halide, do the same uh, type of SN2 reaction to get to the alkyne. Yeah, go ahead. Did you say, I thought you said at the beginning you have to use two alkynes. No, I'm sorry. You have to use just this alkyne and any other things. Yeah. Okay. Um, so someone during the first hour asked, you know, how do you get good at uh, synthesis? And one of the TAs, uh, Wallace, said, you know, it's not really something you can get good at by learning about it and reading about it. It's something you just sort of have to practice, practice, practice. And so that's a fairly good spot for me to start to wax philosophical. Um, I'm better prepared during this hour. I wanted to show, uh, well, I wanted to talk just briefly. I've noticed that many among you, many students that I've talked to over the years have a fair amount of fear of making a mistake. And I feel like we're, your teachers are to blame on this because we give you grades where if you make a mistake, you lose points and then you might not get the grade you want and then we hold that over your head by threatening you that if you don't get the grade you want, you might not get into the school you wanna to go to and so on. And it just builds up into this whole disaster scenario. And I, and I was, I've been there before, I remember many times talking to Amber in our newly married days about how I was sure I was gonna fail a test um, and that all would be lost. And um, 
it never was, right? And I'm still here, and this is 20 years on. So, um, so I, sometimes we have the sense that it's not okay to make a mistake. And uh, I, in the first hour, I wanted to show a picture of one of my children when they were young as an object lesson. And then I opened it up, and, uh, and in my pictures was a picture of me shirtless in front of the mirror trying to get a before picture for my fitness goals and it was so embarrassing. So I'm not gonna show you that and I am going to edit that out of the previous hour. Um, and you know what, it'll happen to you too. Yes, yes, my body mass index is high enough that I was able to get the vaccine sooner than people in my cohort. I told Amber that I was not going to do that, that I was embarrassed, and then my physician friend said, just get the dang vaccine, you fool, and so I did. Um, and I'm 41 years old, and it will happen to you too someday. The dad bod is a real thing. I'm trying to eat healthier and work out, and you know, I deadlifted this morning. It was a great experience, but I still look like that. So I'm not going to show you that picture. <laughs> I am going to show you a younger and slightly, well, that's probably me with maybe 20 to 30 less pounds on him. So yeah, 2014. This is Adam, our youngest. Um, he is now nine. And I think at this point he was about three years old. So I would like even a younger picture, but they don't go that uh, back, far back on the iPad nor do I want to scan through for fear that you'll see other <laughs> things. Um, so anyway, would you ever imagine a small child learning to walk? Um, would you ever look at the child and yell at them and say, you idiot, you fell over, you made a mistake. You're never going to learn to walk. Not only that, but you're never going to get into college and get the job that you want because you fell down. Um, no, in, and in fact, we also wouldn't do the alternative. We also wouldn't take the small child and say, now I want you to sit in that chair and I want you to listen as I explain to you the process of walking, right? First you stand, how do you stand? Well, okay, and then we would have to go back and give a detailed anatomy lesson and then talk about balance and physics and all of this stuff be tremendously inefficient. You could spend all of that time and in the end, the child would get up and fall over anyway. It turns out the way people learn how to walk, it's just fascinating. The, the newborn brain has like gazillions more connections and synapses than we do. And it's because as they bump around into stuff, the brain starts clipping out the synapses that make you bump into stuff and then you start to learn it's tremendously more efficient. And we would never try to interrupt that process by saying, oh, don't, don't even try that, honey, because you might make a mistake. Let me protect you from that. But somehow when it gets to school and sometimes the gospel, we feel like we're gonna white knuckle our way into perfection. If I can just, if I just got baptized, if I can just hold on, I won't make any mistakes and then I get to heaven. In fact, Maybe it would be a great idea for me to stay by myself in this room without any external influences. I can sit here and ponder godliness and I won't ever have to do anything that might cause me to sin. And then Lord, take me into your kingdom. And if you read the parable of the, uh, the talents, the guy that buries his talent is essentially doing that. And Jesus isn't that impressed, right? Because the whole point of, uh, as I told the earlier class, Jesus is not a patch on the plan of salvation. It's not like plan A is for us to all come here and not make any mistakes and just hold on and we'll be perfect in the end. And then, okay, if you trip up, well, those, those of you weak souls that tripped up, you can use Jesus and we'll all be there in the end. No, he is the, only, he is the plan because the only way to gain wisdom to be like our heavenly parents is to bump into stuff and break stuff and learn from it and try to be better. And, and that's, organic chemistry is very much that kind of thing. Um, some of you, as you practice problems, are so afraid of getting the wrong answer that you'll stop yourself and you'll go look at the right answer and then you'll write down the right answer and say, okay, I didn't make any mistakes. But you don't learn from that and you have to actually, as I said, what is it Tony Stark, egg, Stark says about breaking a few eggs? I can't remember what it is. In the, but anyway, you're not going to learn synthesis or organic chemistry without making mistakes. So 
take a deep breath before you take this exam and realize that it's okay to make mistakes and that even if the worst should happen and you should miss a few points on the exam or miss a lot of points on the exam, there's still gonna be pathways ahead to productive and happy lives. Suppose you get a grade in 351 that you don't like and you're like, oh man, now my medical school hopes are all dashed. Well, go talk to actual doctors and ask them how many of them aced organic chemistry. Most of them will say they hated it and they never thought about it again after they took it other than that it gave them tools to understand biochemistry and appreciate the world around them. And they really actually did love their OCHEM professor, which is what you're gonna say. But, um, but uh, even if you have to take it again, so what, right? What's the worst that could happen? I, I just want to make sure that you feel like it's okay to mess up and make mistakes. So I, don't, I think that went more poorly than it did the first round, but hopefully you get the idea and we'll get rid of this cute picture of Adam and the smiles um, belie the fact that there's a whole lot of pain and disgustingness that comes with raising children. So it's not all, it's not all happy. Um, and Adam did his fair share of bonking into things. Mm -hmm. Kind of funny. All right, so that killed some time. Now let's uh, maybe do a couple of mechanism questions. Some of you have asked, where do I go to get uh, interesting and difficult terpene type uh, questions? There's actually some good ones at the end of uh, chapter 10. And you can find others in uh, just by Googling terpenes. But um, this one is one I did in the last hour and I thought it was useful because it looks like it's just gonna be totally heinous and then it's only like three steps long. Um, for a lot of folks, solving organic chemistry problems requires a lot of sort of self-discipline to take a deep breath and avoid freaking out and then and just get started and see how it goes. Um, all right, so this horrible, this is like, this thing is out of your nightmares, right? It's like all these rings and they're fused together and there's a four-membered ring. Um, and we're gonna make it worse because we're gonna tell you that in the end, you have to convert it into this thing, which is even more, oops, there's not a methyl group there. Wait, yes, there was even more terrible. Yikes, what the heck are we gonna do with that? And all you're told is that a strong acid does this. All right, well, what do you do? You gotta rely on what you know and take a few steps into the unknown and then try to use things that you know to get from A to B. One of the things I notice is in the starting material and in the product, I've got different size rings, right? I used to have a six-membered ring and a four-membered ring. Now I just have two five-membered rings. Same number of atoms, so probably I've got to do something that changes the six-membered ring into a smaller ring. The, the problem gives you a hint and says, carbocation rearrangement may be necessary. That's a hint that's not a hint because you wonder whether they're, game, they're playing, playing you by saying may be necessary, distracting you down a pathway that will be useless. But let's just take that for what it's worth and uh, put it in the back of our mind that that might be something we need to do. You know, looking at the starting material, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get too far off by saying, okay, homo versus lumo. I have an acid, I have a pi bond. I know what to do in that situation. If the molecule were simple like this, I would say easy peasy. The kids aren't saying that one anymore, but somehow it came out. You would simply have the pi electrons attack the proton, leaving group leaves. You'd make a bond between the car less substituted carbon and the proton so that the more substituted carbon could have the positive charge. Okay, same thing here. Let's have the pi electrons attack the hydrogen and then 
we'll have the bond formed with the less substituted carbon so that the more substituted carbon can have the positive charge. That seems like the reasonable thing to do, and in fact, it's the only thing I can think of to do that, the, uh, that will happen with this molecule. There's sort of nothing else for the acid to do. Okay, so I'm one step in. Now, at this stage, I should ask, is there anything I could do possibly to turn a six-membered ring into a five-membered ring. That, and you're already told that a carbocation rearrangement might be involved. So let's sort of focus in on that. Carbocation rearrangements, what we, do, what we do there is we identify the carbon that has the positive charge. That's the alpha carbon. And then we look for groups on the three beta carbons. In this case, um, the ones here are protons. If I did a one, two hydride shift, that would simply take a tertiary carbocation and change it into a secondary one, which seems counterproductive and also doesn't allow us to change the size of the ring. So I'm gonna temporarily sort of forget about those and, and assume they're not involved. I might also do a 1,2 hydride shift with this proton on the methyl group, but that would trade a tertiary carbocation for a primary carbocation, which you've been told not to ever show as an intermediate in a reaction in solution, so we're going to discount that option. You've got your third beta carbon, and it's attached to three different Things. They're not, al they're not uh, protons, but they're alkyl groups. So here's one, here's two, and then I need another color. Here's the third. So uh, now I can start thinking about one, two alkyl shifts. And I can just use trial and error to see whether anything gets me closer to the product. So what if I did the one, two methyl shift? That would convert my one intermediate to another one. And that looks reasonable, but the challenge is it doesn't really get me in the right direction. In fact, if I look at my product, I don't have any carbons that have two methyl groups. So even though that step is reasonable, it's, it doesn't lead me to the product. So, oh brother, Trent, you're a, you're a master. Terpene or not terpene? That is the question. <laughs> Such good dad ochem jokes. Uh, so this one is not gonna be uh, productive. So let's not worry about moving the methyl group over. Uh, if we moved the green atom over, it doesn't look like you should be able to because it looks kind of far away, but we're thinking about anything can do an alkyl shift if it's attached to the beta carbon. So we could consider these uh, electrons moving over to create a new bond between the alpha carbon and the green carbon. I'm not going to draw that product because if you look at what that would do, it would create a one, two, three, four, five membered ring, but it leaves the six membered ring in place. And I need two five membered rings, not a five and a six. So I'm going to temporarily not worry about that. Now let's suppose that we do the one, two alkyl shift with the purple carbon. We're gonna make a new bond between purple carbon and alpha carbon. When you do this, it's useful at first to just draw the molecule in exactly the same way. Uh, and then we'll draw the new bond we formed between purple carbon and what used to be the carbocation. Now the positive charge is on that adjacent carbon. Uh, if we look at that and we wanna redraw that, we actually do now have the right pattern of rings attached to each other. Um, let's see.
Okay, and that was just a one, two alkyl shift. Now we can ask, do we have something? Uh, why did we not want to? Do we have a reaction that could convert this carbocation into the desired product? What do you think? What do you got? Positive charge here, pi bond there. Yeah. Elimination reaction. Here's a new alpha carbon, a new beta carbon with the proton attached. This is like the second step of an E1 reaction from the carbocationic intermediate. We remove a beta proton and electrons kick down to form the new pi bond. And there you go. That is the final product. So that looked terrible, but it was really only two, three steps long. One was protonate the uh, pi electrons to put the positive charge on the more substituted carbon. Another was one, two carbocation rearrangement. And then finally E1 style elimination. Yeah. Right, anything attached to the beta carbon, if, even if it's not a methyl group or a hydrogen, even if it's some other kind of alkyl group, can do the one, two rearrangement. I think the problem that you're referring to, hold on, uh, there's just a question from the chat on what we were doing. Why is the positive charge changing? We, we move this bond between purple and orange to be between purple and alpha carbon. That takes these electrons away, and therefore the, per the orange carbon ends up with the positive charge. And then uh, we do the elimination reaction. Now, I think the question that you just asked was about this terpene practice problem. Um, and the carbocation rearrangement step is here. So uh, this generated some questions in the first hour that I thought might be useful to address. We have pi electrons attack the positive charge. That's one of our uh, simple terpene-like reaction steps. And we make the new bond with the less substituted carbon so that the more substituted one can have the positive charge. Nevertheless, if you look at the final product, you have um, the orange carbon bonded to two methyl groups, and it's connected not to this carbon, but to this one, the one with the other methyl group. To get that connectivity, we actually have to do a one, two alkyl shift where the orange carbon moves over to make a new bond with, car with this tertiary carbon. And that results in what's probably a less stable uh, secondary carbocation. Now, uh, I wouldn't have asked you to do this in a predict the product sense, because why would you go uphill in energy? Uh, you know you have to in this case, because that's the only way to get a positive charge on this carbon so that water can attack and give you the desired product. Um, so in a mechanism question, uh, you may have to do a carbocation rearrangement that you wouldn't otherwise predict, but becomes necessary to get the right connectivity. I will say the story is more complicated here. There is evidence that these two are not in equilibrium, but rather they are resonance structures of each other. There's, there's decent evidence that the real structure is a hybrid one in which you have three atoms and two electrons delocalized between them. Yeah. If you have to in a mechanism question, you can do a shift that's not favorable. Now, in a predict products question, I'm not going to ask you to predict that a carbon carbocation rearrangement would happen unless it can lead to a more stable product. Okay. So as is in the case with a 
quaternary carbon adjacent to a secondary carbocation. You trade a, a less stable secondary carbocation for a more stable tertiary one. Similar situation if you have a tertiary carbon adjacent to a secondary carbocation by rearrangement, in this case a 1,2 hydride shift, you get a more stable carbocation. So that's what I want you to be able to predict, but for the mechanism, you just need to use whatever tools, including carbocation rearrangement, give you the right connectivity. Yeah? Uh, no, so yeah, it's a good question. Would I want you to show uh, only products that come after the rearrangement? No, I would want you to show products that come from both the rearranged and the non-rearranged carbocations. Yeah. Um, somebody else pointed out uh, that, well, if you're going to do a carbocation rearrangement that doesn't make sense, then why not just have these pi electrons attack and make the bond with the less subs the more substituted carbon and have the positive charge on the less substituted carbon. That's fine if, if, if you had had, if you had drawn going directly from here to here with opposite regioselectivity, that's fine too, because as I said, there's evidence that these two are not in fact in equilibrium with each other, but rather they're the same thing. That's a grad level OCHEM concept, so don't worry about it, but um, it's kind of cool. All right. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Um, in the study guide, you said to ignore the E1 products mm. of TSOH, but in the practice <laughs> exam, uh, I think all of yes. TSOH have the E1. What would you prefer for the test? Okay, I am sorry about that. So the question has been, what do you do for mechanism when you try to do alcohol dehydration? Uh, toluene sulfon uh, let's see, paratoluene sulfonic acid or TSOH, we're going to use interchangeably with sulfuric acid, uh, and that gives you dehydration products. The question, and your book sort of takes you through uh, secondary and tertiary alcohols, and uh, the products are easy to predict, but in terms of mechanism, your book tells you that for secondary and tertiary alcohols, the mechanism is uh, E1-like. You have a carbocation intermediate, but for the primary, it's SN, or I'm sorry, it's E2 because primary carbocations are too unstable. The problem I was trying to deal with in previous iterations of the class was that I thought that was a little too confusing. So I decided to simplify it and say, okay, let's just pretend that it's all E2. Unfortunately, I still wanted to talk about carbocation rearrangement, but I had just taken the carbocation out of the picture. So I taught carbocation rearrangement anyway, but then I've muddied the waters. And so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to ask you to show me a mechanism for alcohol dehydration. We'll just guarantee that. Now, you should be able to do carbocation rearrangement. You should be able to predict that it happens. No excuse for not predicting that. We spent a lot of time on that. And if I ask you to show a mechanism for how a carbocation rearrangement happens, I feel like you've got plenty of experience on that. But no, I'm not going to ask, a, is this E2 or is it E1 kind of question to trip you up because I obviously messed that up. So I'm sorry about that. Okay, what else? Yeah. Uh, uh, a case where pKa is important. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, the, the question is, I think a case where acid-base reasoning might be important for thinking about um, uh, the most effective synthesis. Uh, I, I think I showed you last time a reaction where uh, 
we were going to use an alkyne as a nucleophile, and we wanted to have it end up next to an OH group. And we were talking about how the SN2 reaction here maybe is reasonable, but you have a competing acid-base reaction where the oxygen, uh, uh, the OH group has a pKa of about 16, the conjugate acid of an alkyne has a pKa of 25. So what's actually more likely to happen is that the alkyne, instead of attacking the Br, removes a proton from the OH. So if indeed you wanted to end up with a product where the alkyne is attached adjacent to an OH group, this is why we said it was much better to just do the epoxide because then there's no acidic proton to worry about. So that's, that's maybe all I can think of where we use pKa considerations to worry about an undesired side reaction. Okay, we're gonna need to leave it there. Thank you, good luck on the exam.